Ah, hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 163, I was very privileged to have Emily on the podcast today. Uh, we, like, She is a author and speaker. We were talking about her new book, uh, Love and Living uh, Your Way Through Grief. We talked about her book, and basically we talked about her time when she lost uh, both of her husbands, we also talked about her time when, huh, how can I say, her first job uh, when she was a kid of 14. Let's just say it was a very interesting one indeed. All I've got to say is, uh, yeah, uh, Emily is one of those rare people which, uh, with so many things will go wrong in life. You really meet people who can be that sort of bright star And I would say she is one of those people who is a bright star And yeah, basically, um, yeah, living life to the max uh, Yeah, you get people who can buy anything But you don't get that many people who have lived their lives to the max Where they've lived like, lived to a point where you can't really say you can do anything else But anyway, so please sit back, enjoy the podcast And yeah, please remember to subscribe It really helps the podcast out And yeah, have an awesome day No problem, bye bye for now Peace <laughs> Oh Hello my friends, hello my life warriors Wherever you are in the world Welcome to the Day In Day Out podcast Woo! Today on episode <laughs> 163, I've got Emily, <clears throat> how's that? Emily Faroe Freif on the podcast today? No. Threat. Threat, excuse me. Yeah. Threat, I knew I was going to get that wrong. I, deep down, I knew, I knew. <laughs> she is a author and speaker. And yeah, her book is A Living at... Like, Loving and living uh, your way through grief. Uh, yes. How are you today, my lady? I'm just wonderful and happy to be here talking to you. I'm happy you're here as well. Now, look, um, we have got a huge time difference between us. You are all the way in like Honolulu. When I saw that, I was like, I'm the thing, what the one TV show, what kept going through my mind, and I don't care. I'm sure, like, not, not the new one, but the original. What, what TV show do you think that was? That probably is Magnum PI. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, then uh, Hawaii Five O. That's the one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> those are the two main ones, right? Oh, no, I think those are the two only ones. Which well, <laughs> actually, there's a brand new one on HBO right now called White Lotus, Ooh. and it's it's about a hotel here on Maui where I live on Maui, and uh, it's it's kind of a it's, they've only had one episode so far, and it's kind of dark. So, <laughs> oh, okay, when you say dark, you know, I was like. It's kind of uh, dark. Uh, will you be going back to watch the second episode or the first? Yeah, I, I want to see what they're doing with it. It's so neat to see a show where you're seeing, well, I've been at that beach or I've come in there or we ate there. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not like one of those crime like TV procedurals where you're like, you got, I've been, no, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> No, no, no. Like, may I ask, how long have you been living on the big island uh, no i'm not on the big island the big island oh. is the island of hawaii and they call it big island because people get the island of hawaii confused with the state of hawaii and i live on maui and oh. uh my favorite island and i've been here six years six years what brought you out to maui for like your time because you've well, done a lot of jobs in your time i know yes i have <laughs> um my husband uh, had lived on Maui many years ago, long before I knew him. Mm. And when his health was seriously declining, he said, you know, I really would like to live on Maui again. So we just sold everything and came out here. Oh my God. So you just up sticks, came out there and like, yeah, like you've been yeah. living there ever since. I see. Yeah. And he, he uh, got to spend two years with me before he died. And I've been on my own here since then. And, and I truly love it here. Right. Okay. Like, this is the thing. I, I know some people would have been like, yeah, you know, like, this was his place. I'm glad I shared my time with him there. But it's time for me to sort of move on. And like, you know, chapter close. 
like and then like live a new chapter of your life and which isn't the easiest thing to do after mm-hmm. that no but like you decided to stay on like you fell in love with the place that deeply I, I did. I, I kept having people that I had known in California say, when are you coming home? And my answer was, I am home. Ah. It's, uh, things are so different here in Hawaii. Everything is, is based around love. The word aloha, one of the meanings of aloha is love. And you always say hello aha, to people when you greet them, when you say goodbye to them. Mm. Uh, there's even a law of aloha in this state that businesses are required to operate with aloha. And I, I don't think any other state or country has <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so how would you operate with love technically as a business? As Oh, that means you're always honest. You're always, um, it, it's just full of integrity, mm-hmm. uh, full of um, joy, basically yeah. happiness. You smile at your, your customers. You um, try to work out whatever you need to between you to make the best results for both of you. So it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I, I had heard about it and then I got called to jury duty. And, and when I was waiting out in the hallway in the courthouse, they had a, a big framed uh, l- copy of the law of Aloha. So you could read the whole thing and it's, it's online. You can look it up online and see what the law of Aloha is. <laughs> and I, I take it you have that. Uh, being a lecturer and all that in your past did you mm-hmm. actually go through the whole law yourself or did you just like oh. no I, I did read the whole thing and I think it's really nice and and I, I kind of operate that way here too because my my basic belief is everything is love mm-hmm. and so you should you should come from your from your heart on everything that you do and and be kind and be happy and everything that you do and that's what I found here that the Hawaiian word for family is aloha and not aloha. I'm sorry. I've got aloha in my mind this morning. <laughs> it's ohana. <laughs> ah. And I, I developed a Ron and I, when he was still here with me, developed an ohana here on the Island, even though we didn't have any blood relatives. So many people came into what we considered as close as family. And I'm still close with them there. I know all of my neighbors we're very comfortable with each other. We support each other. We're in and out of each other's lives. Like last night, uh, my neighbor from across the street brought over a couple pieces of apple pie that she'd just made because she just knew that my son who's living with me and I would enjoy her apple pie oh. and just out of the blue, you know, and we, we do things like that for each other all the time, give rides to people, make recommendations for people, whatever it is that we can do to uh, just be happy. Uh, sounds like you've got a real sense of like great community there because yes. like yeah because like this is the thing like you mm-hmm. are formerly a California native and like you know mm-hmm. I mean, the way people how can I say it feels like people are just like jumping ship out of that state as quickly as possible <laughs> you are like sort of six years ahead of the curve look at your face yes. <laughs> he is like I got out at the right time that's what he's being yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I lived there my whole life till I came over here, different places in California, but I lived there my whole life. Mm. And I've never known my neighbors like I know them here, never. And I would, when I'd move into a neighborhood, I would bake cookies and take them to everybody who lived around me and introduce myself and try to be friends. Never had neighbors like I have here, ever. Wow. Wow. So now you've been, like, you've been on the big, well, not the big island. Yes. Yeah. On, on Maui. <laughs> Maui. Maui. Like, yes. I don't know how I'm going to forget Maui because, yes, he was in that, that Disney cartoon. I can't, like, can't forget it. And, like, when <laughs> Ohana, I, like, Lilo and Stitch comes to mind now, and I can't get that on my ha- head as well. But, yeah. How did you come up with the concept of your book? Because, yes. Well, I have been a writer my whole life. I taught writing for 30 years at the university and I wrote three college textbooks. And so writing is very, very comfortable for me. Mm. And after Ron died, I was going, okay, now what do I do? And so I started exploring through writing what I was feeling, what was going on, what did I need to know, all that kind of thing. And the more I wrote, the more I found that certain things that I did with my writing really helped me. Mm. And I thought, wow, I could help other people by teaching them how to do this. And so with all the people I knew on the island, I didn't know anybody who was dealing with grief. 
So there's a, I don't know if you have Meetup over there, but there's a, an app called Meetup where you can put schedule a meeting on it and just put it out to the public and say, if you want to come, come. So I did that. I uh, put a notice on Meetup that I was going to have a writing through grief class at my house and just waited to see who showed up and people showed up and we, it was just great. I started out doing it once a month and they liked it so much. They said, can we do it every other week instead? Mm. And it was all different kinds of grief. It was not just, uh, I was thinking it might be just widows, but someone had lost a child, someone lost their mom, someone had gotten divorced. There, there are lots of different kinds of loss. And we got to be a pretty tight knit group until the pandemic and we couldn't meet on ground anymore. So yeah. we've been, uh, they, and they weren't particularly computer people. So we, we tried to do it online, but I ended up <laughs> making a writing through brief with Emily group on Facebook and continued it there. And now we're just getting to the point where we're going to be doing it on ground again. Anyway, in doing all that kind of writing, I, my husband had a really good friend on the mainland and they were family friends. They lived a couple blocks away from us. Mm. And the guy was at least 20 years younger than my husband was. And he always called my husband dad. And uh, my husband looked like you and his friend looked like me. So <laughs> it was real interesting when people would say, he's your dad. <laughs> what can I say? But, Handsome fellow then. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, um, one day he just died. Chap died, my husband's friend. Um, out of the blue he wasn't sick nobody anticipated it and I was so concerned for his wife mm. because she wouldn't have ever probably thought that her husband was going to die and what she would need to do he owned a big business that she really wasn't a part of and all of a sudden she had to run it um, she had teenage or daughters she had so much stuff on her plate and she just didn't I, I knew that she was going to be in shock so I thought, what can I do? So I sat down and I, I found out a few hours after he died. So I sat down and wrote a, a big, long letter to her of these are the things that you need to think about right now. And these are the things that you don't need to deal with right now. And don't let anybody say that they're a priority because they're not. And I wanted to get it to her right away. So I emailed it to a friend of mine that lived a couple blocks away from her and who was a mutual friend too. And she took the letter to her. And later, my friend let me know that that letter meant the world to her, that nobody else talked to her like that. Nobody else gave her that information. And that when the time came, she had two daughters. She said she read the letter out loud to each of them individually when she thought that they needed to hear what was in the letter. Yeah. So it was uh, a pretty powerful experience. And so I thought, what else can I do for her? This, this, you know, I'm glad I did this, but I want to do more. So I decided I was going to write her a card every week for the first year. So 52 different cards. And I'm always taking pictures here because it's so beautiful. So I put a pretty Hawaiian and they had visited, visited us here. So they, we could, you know, really relate to the, the pictures. Yeah. And I put a different card, <clears throat> sorry, a different picture on each one of the cards. And then I thought, okay, what am I going to put inside for 52? That's a lot. <laughs> right. So I, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try and, and write these out and see what I could come up with. And within 24 hours, I had written 52 different things that would serve her at different points during that first year that she was on her own. And I thought, I thought that was really neat. So I started sending them to her and uh, I had told a friend that I had done that. And she said, oh, I've got somebody I'd really love to send those cards to. Can you make some for me? Cause I just made them on my computer. <laughs> so I did, and it took a while to make them. So as I was making a second set of cards, I decided I'd listen to a podcast. And on the, the podcast, I really re resonated with the woman who was being interviewed and she had written a book and I thought, I'm going to get her book. I'm going to go right now to her website and get her book. So when I looked at her website, the, the book order, was, the option was down at the bottom of it. And right before the book order option, it said, I'm also a writing agent. So if you have a book in mind, let me know. And I said, hmm, I've got a. 52 point outline written. So 
I wrote to her right then. She wrote right back and became my agent. We're great friends now. She lives in Toronto in Canada, so <laughs> international thing here. But uh, we're working with her, we got a uh, publisher for the book and it came out in January. And I've had such a wonderful response to it because so many, I, I read so many books on grief mm. between two husbands dying. And most of them were so sad. And I thought people need to have something that can bring them up, that can give them hope, that can give them something to do to actively work on things dealing with their grief. So that's what I did. At the end of each chapter, <clears throat> I have a, a practice, they call them, of something that you can do to uh, help yourself as you, you're dealing with your grief. So that's, that's where the book came from. Mm. Like, wow, like, okay, like, you know what, uh, doing 52 cards for someone, like, to help them through their first year of grief, uh, like, basically, that, like, that is a monumental effort in this day and age, because, look, it, like, you go, oh, it's 52 messages, you go, yeah, it is 52 messages, and yes, you could have went, you know what, I'm, I'm going to email them to you. And like that would have made things slightly easier, but it lacks that sort of personal touch, that sort of personal connection to say, you know what? I understand what you're going through. And look, I'm here to support you. Uh, that's one of the things I have to say is like, wow, like, whoa, that is wow, heavy uh, to say the least. But like, <laughs> so it's just like, come, like, what? I don't know how you just was like, yeah, that is the sort of spark of my inspiration to do that because you could have just went, okay, I'll send you a letter. Okay. I'll send just one off letter and just left it at that. But to go, yeah, 52 cards. It's like, I'm sort of flabbergasted and sort of baffled at the same time. Like where you got that from? Did you see it somewhere or is it just that spark of well inspiration? I had um, a few years before a dear friend of mine had breast cancer and it was when Ron was still here and we were talking about it and he goes, you know, you really need to stay in close touch with her as she's going through her chemotherapy and her radiation. And mm. I said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. So I decided that I would. And <clears throat> during the whole period that she was going through all the therapy, I would either email her or text her or send her a card or write her a letter or something a couple of times every week. And she, when and she, she did very well and came out of it uh, in, in good shape. And mm -hmm. when she did, she said that what I had done had helped her so much. So I think that was kind of the, the seed yeah. for the idea of doing this. And I was glad I did that for her. I, I learned a lot about me and about cancer in the process. And um, I, I'm, I'm glad I did it. And I'm really grateful that it inspired me to do the book. Mm, yeah like would you like would you say the like the loss of like your two husbands like yeah you know, has has that given you sort of much more of a clearer perspective when it comes to like yeah end of days death and like what's next yeah it, it really does um ron and i lived very much in the moment that mm. was very important to us because i'm i knew we both knew what was coming and we both wanted to make the very most of the time that we had together. So in, in the process of that, I, I knew that he, he was going to die mm. and I knew what it was like when my other husband had died and I was kind of anticipating, I had an anticipation of what that would be. And my, my other husband was um, not religious at all. He'd been brought up Catholic and he, as an adult, when he became a philosophy professor at the college, um, realized that his philosophy didn't match with uh, Catholicism. Yeah, that would, yeah, that would do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so he, he was <clears throat> most definitely an agnostic, uh, kind of leaning toward athe atheist. And then Ron was a religious science minister. So they couldn't have been more different. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, with <clears throat> when when Jacques died he knew he was ill he, he mm. knew that he was you know he had he was suffering with lots of different problems and 
even, even though he knew that, I don't think he recognized that he was dying. And we really didn't talk about it much, which was interesting because his specialty in philosophy was living and dying. Mm. And he brought hospice to the community where we lived because there hadn't been a hospice there before. Um, he worked all the time. He taught the class that all the nurses had to take on dealing with living and dying. And so he, he was so into this stuff, but he didn't equate it to him somehow. It just <laughs> didn't cross over. Yeah. I, and I, I he had, that, yeah, I, I believe I'm, I believe I'm a mortal. I'm not, nothing's going to take me down. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was kind of it. He kept thinking all the therapy he was going through, everything that he was doing, he was, it was going to make him better, that he was going to get better and go on with his life like it had been before. Mm. And watching his decline, it was so obvious that that wasn't going to happen, but we didn't really talk about it. We talked a lot about his book. He'd written a book he was a lot older than I am. And he had written a book back in 1975 called Ethics, Theory, and Practice that was a college textbook. It's still being used today internationally. Wow. And college textbooks don't last that long usually. But he, uh, in order to keep using it, he had to keep updating it, doing a new edition to make the, the problems and discussions in the book relevant to the time period then. Mm. So we had been working on the the new edition of his textbook that was going to come out and they usually come out in about two years and he'd been working on the new edition for about three years and they kept going when's it coming but it was so hard for him to do that we we worked on it together and we finally got it together and it was the first time we'd been able to submit a book electronically. So we sent it in and we called the editor and said, we just sent the, the book in and we celebrated and it was really great and had a great time. And it was right before lunch and I fixed him lunch and it, then I was going to take him to his dialysis appointment because he had congestive heart failure and renal failure. Oh my God. So when he was sitting there eating lunch, I was in a kitchen washing dishes. So we weren't looking at each other face to face. And he said, am I going to get better? And I thought, oh my gosh, he's been in denial this entire time. And I hadn't recognized it. Mm -hmm. We just hadn't talked about it that much, but that was what was happening. And, and I had to say no. And that's all I said. I just said no, because I, we also always told each other the truth. So uh, when it was time to go dialysis and getting him in the car at our house, he sat in the car and he looked up at me and he said, oh, and then a word that begins with S and ends with T and died just like that. So I'm thinking with, with him, he was, he was holding on. He was going through all that he was going on, going through for two years because he thought he was going to get better. Doctors heal you when you go to the doctor, they make yeah. you better. And it just didn't turn out that way. So when it turned out that Ron had congestive heart failure and renal failure and ended up on dialysis, just the same way that Jacques had, uh, I kind of, I knew what to expect. I knew what was coming. I was able to help Ron with a lot of stuff, but he also looked at it very realistically. He knew that he wasn't going to be in on this plane that much longer. Mm. And we really made the best of everything. It was just like moving to Hawaii. What a big, big deal to do. But it was it was a wonderful thing to do. And he was in and out of the hospital a lot here, but it, it was OK. We were just uh, having a, a really uh, wonderful experience. And then when when he got when it got toward the end he started having and this probably isn't really exciting to talk about but massive diarrhea uh -huh. and so we took him to the emergency room because it, it just wouldn't stop it was mm. incredible and they hospitalized him and in a week he lost 35 pounds oh god and wasn't really able to eat and they weren't able to tell him why he was having this diarrhea uh they kept doing tests and doing more tests and doing stuff and he just wasn't getting any better. And so on a Friday, when the, the doctor came in, Ron said, what are you going to do for me? And he said, well, we can do these tests. And he says, we've done 
tests. We've done enough tests. What are you going to do for me? And he goes, well, there's not really a whole lot that we can do. And he said, well, then I'm going home. And the doctor said, well, you're going to have to go against medical advice and we won't send any medication home with you. And, you know, all this very uh, unfriendly yeah. things. And he said, I don't care if you if you're not helping me, there's no reason for me to stay here. I'd rather be where it's beautiful and I'm surrounded by all the people that I love. And he, he said, OK. And so he, he went home without all of his medication and everything he needed. And we had a friend who was a hospice nurse and I called her and I said, he doesn't want to go on hospice because he doesn't think he's dying uh, right now. And she, she said, okay, but she helped us. She got the hospice doctor to come out and do the prescriptions that he needed for him since the hospital wouldn't give them to him. And the hospice doctor did it with no problem and got uh, care because I needed extra care to, to help with him once he got home and got all that arranged. And, it, it was it was wonderful having him here. And then by Monday, he looked at me, he said, you know, it's time for me to go on hospice. And I said, okay, so we made the arrangements and let everybody know. And they friends and family flew in from the mainland. And it was like a party here at the house for, for a week. Uh, he, he was vegan and all he wanted to eat was barbecued ribs. And so <laughs> we knew somebody who could yes. make good barbecued ribs. And <laughs> yes. yeah. They break eventually at the end. Yes. <laughs> so we, we ate, they, they played games out, out in the yard. Our yard's big and beautiful, and you can see both sides of the island from it. And um, we, we spent good time together. The, we'd mm. dance, we'd listen to music, we would, and everybody was just so loving and wonderful around him. And then... He died on Friday. He went on hospice on Monday and died on Friday. And he got to say goodbye to everybody he wanted to say goodbye to. If they didn't come to Maui, he FaceTimed with them so he could actually look at them and make sure that nothing was left unsaid. Mm. And it was quite beautiful. Yeah, like this is the thing. Like, it's one of those things with, like, I think in many respects, we're kind of like in Western society, we're kind of sort of shielded from the sort of whole realm of sort of death on a large scale, I put it this way, if it wasn't for a certain uh, pandemic in 2020 and still continuing now, uh, they kind of would still be like, I would say this is the most exposure we've had to it in mm -hmm. like since basically, let's say the Second World War, where it's like being kind mm -hmm. of like a reality for pretty much everyone. But with that sort of shielding, there is like that whole thing of, yeah, we believe life will keep on going on, keep on going on, and you'll be still part of life as it goes forward. Not, mm -hmm. not like, like not taking into account of life was going on a hell of a lot longer when you weren't here, and then you, when you showed up, it didn't magically all just begin. It wasn't like someone just turned on the switch, but they can't get past that whole thing. Like, and like with regards to both of your husbands, it's like. Okay, there was a long sort of journey for both of them to sort of get to that point of, ah, okay, accept it. Like, look, I'm, like your first husband, like, God bless his soul, but when he was just like, yeah, ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's when, yeah, just left very, mm -hmm. like, very abruptly. Uh, but yeah, your second husband, when he had the opportunity to say goodbye and, like, you know what I mean, make peace with everything everyone and everything he wanted to make peace with like i can only hope i can like be in that sort of position i think that's what many of us would like to be because it can come on swiftly it can come on quickly and yeah they like people go yeah you regret the things you don't do i think you regret more the things you leave unfinished not like oh I must conquer this hill or mountain, but the things that, like the conversations, the relationships you have with your closest, your dearest. But yeah. And yeah, you got to dance and have good mm. ribs and have the mm. company of great friends. Like, that's magical. I, yeah, I, it was. <laughs> yeah. So with like, with that, like, with all what's gone on with regards to like, yeah, 
your both of your husbands passing and stuff like this. Like, would like what would you say like before this happened, like two times? What was your like sort of like relationship with death then? I know that sounds rather macabre. Or, no, it yeah. doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I had quite a relationship with death, uh, mm. an amazing relationship with death. When I was um, 13 years old, <clears throat> my dad traded our home for an ambulance company. And the ambulance company was only two and a half years old and was very much in the red. Right. And so we had to move from our house onto this small, into a small house on the property of the ambulance company. And the three of us essentially ran it together, even at my age. The, we did all the dispatching. They didn't have services like they have now that do 911. I, I don't know what it is over there, but do emergency dispatching. We, we yeah. had to dispatch ourselves. Uh, we had to wash all the bloody sheets on our washer and hang them out to dry because we didn't have a dryer. So it was, it was very primitive. And at that time also, you only had to be 14 years old and have an advanced first aid certificate to go on ambulance calls. And my dad happened to be the first aid instructor for town. Oh, no. So I ended up going on my first ambulance call on my 14th birthday, where two families were in cars that ran head on into each other at high speed and there were multiple fatalities. Okay, look, I, one, I'm trying to get my head around like, have it like owning an ambulance service because like here in the UK, like no, there I don't think there's ever been anything like that since I don't know, maybe like maybe back in the day, like back in the Victorian age, they may have had something like that. But owning an ambulance service, that it's to, to me that is a peculiar business to have. Uh, (laughs) it it still is actually i still own the company we celebrate our 61st anniversary this year whoa like you sold the company okay Uh, but to like go hey hey kiddo oh like you know what Mm -hmm. yeah tomorrow it's gonna be your 14th birthday ah you're looking forward to it yeah i'm like oh you remember that course i like took you out on yeah (laughs) it's time to get into the family business happy birthday yeah (laughs) Oh my God. <laughs> and like, yeah, that was day. Oh my, <laughs> it's like, oh my God. So, okay. So from that point, which I, I, I can imagine that was probably was most like quite a scarring day or for you on your back. Well, I don't know if I call it scarring, but it certainly oh, was a make me think. Building. Yeah. Uh, a make, make me think about what life is, what death is, mm. about how you're here one moment and the next moment you're not. So I started having those kinds of thoughts for myself a lot younger than most people do, I think. Right. So like, basically you had a real sort of clear view of your mortality and mm-hmm. how you're tethered to this world uh, one way or the other. So would you say like your early experience working for like working with your dad uh in the ambulance service um helped you sort of like look for things you really wanted to do like you know i mean go on those sort of special adventures you wanted to like take to get to get in touch with the world Mm -hmm. well it made me go the opposite direction (laughs) you know i knew that I, as much I worked all the way through high school yeah. uh, with the company, and as soon as I graduated, I said, "I'm going away for college. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> going to stay in this town." And I went away as a theater major at uh, San Diego State University. Uh, I'd done a lot of theater in high school because, again, it was a way to not go home because we'd have uh, rehearsals in the afternoons or evenings, and so if I went home, I was on call. <laughs> Okay. Uh, if I was involved in a school activity, then uh, I didn't have to go home. So I, I was very involved in theater and I, I met somebody and married somebody who was involved in theater. We were both theater majors at the university and we got married right after his junior year in college and he was uh, going to graduate the next year. And so I was working that first year to support him through his last year of college. Mm. Well, that was during the Vietnam War. And he ended up with a draft number that indicated that he probably was likely to 
be going to Vietnam. Yeah. And so unbeknownst to me, he became a police officer when I thought he was going to school. And he did that because you could have a draft deferral if you were serving your country at home. Uh. So here I set up my life to be doing theater because we were going to join what's called the, it was called the teacher corps here in the, in the U.S. and go to some place that didn't have arts programs for their students and, and create arts programs for them. Yeah. And we were very excited about it. So going from that to being a cop, was about as different as it could be. And one of the things that I did not too long into him being a cop was go to a funeral for another police officer. And that officer had a name that he didn't go by the, the, the full name. I think he went by like his middle name and his middle name was uh, Patrick and they called him Pat. Mm. My husband's name was Patrick and they called him Pat. And I had two small children at that time. And we were sitting right behind the row where this officer's wife and two small children about my kid's age were sitting. And I was listening to this eulogy for Pat, the police officer. Oh, dear. No, no. So I said, okay, I need to get into a vocation where I can get money right now and be able to take care of my kids if something happens to him. Mm. So um, I became a nurse because it seemed logical to me to do that with my background that I'd had in the ambulance company. And uh, I, again, saw lots, lots more death and dying and things going on there. And then that, that marriage ultimately didn't work out because we probably, you know, it wasn't based on honesty to start off with when he did what he did. And we just never could really connect after that. Yeah. So we ended up getting divorced. And that's that's when I met my second husband, who was my first husband to die. So I've had had three husbands. So uh, I, I had. You OK? Yeah, no, no. I, I could hear noise coming out of the window. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. No, no, please continue. So um, we I ended up uh, marrying these other two guys and then going through these experiences with them. So I've had all these different perspectives on living and dying throughout my life. And I, I actually had another experience just a, a, a couple months ago um, where I live on the side of a volcano, of all things, since I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> and it's all volcanoes over here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's well known for it, but like, yeah. Yes, uh, mine. Mine isn't active. The one on the Big Island of Hawaii is active, and we've we've seen lots of lava on the TV news at night from over there. But here, it's it's not active. But I'm so I'm up on the up at a higher elevation than hmm. than a lot of the island. And I was coming home from being down on where we're called the Valley Isle. And the valley is between like two volcanoes. And that, that valley is just about sea level. So I was coming up from that up the side of this. this uh, we don't have very many highways here either because there, there aren't that many people. Most of the roads are like two lane roads. But there is a highway that goes from down there to up toward where I live. Yeah. And I was going up on that highway driving with my son who lives with me now in, in the car. And somebody was coming down the highway on the other side and swerved over the, the median, which that lane was much higher than ours. So he went downhill right into me. Oh, no. And my son saw it before I did. And, and I, don't, I don't even know what he said, but I could tell that, that something was really wrong. And as I turned my head to look, it looked like this truck was right next to my face, practically. And I slammed on the brakes, held on as tight as I could, closed my eyes and felt a bump and then nothing else. And so I opened my eyes and I looked around. I couldn't see a truck. I thought, did I imagine this? You know, my car didn't look like it was that damaged, but I, I pulled over to the side of the road because I was shaking so hard I couldn't drive. And these yeah. two other cars pulled over, uh, two different uh, young women in two different cars had both witnessed it. And they said they couldn't believe that we were alive. He was coming so fast right at you. And then he just hit you and swerved so that he was going 
against oncoming traffic down the road. And he had to go a while because there wasn't any place to, to pull over. Yeah. But he, he ultimately pulled over. And I just, I was just in shock. I thought this, when my first thought was, okay, this is it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to be gone now, you know? <laughs> and when I stopped shaking as much, cause I shook for a few days after that, I thought, you know what? It was okay. Whatever happened, however it turned out was absolutely okay. And I'm, I'm good with it. And if I died then, I died then and it was okay. And I'm grateful that I didn't because I feel like I've got so much to do with my book and helping comfort and support other people who are grieving. Mm. So I'm really grateful that I didn't. And everybody that uh, all my friends and anybody that I've told about this, they said, Ron knew that and he turned that truck. <laughs> because there was no other explanation for it. He was coming at me so fast and downhill right into me. And it only was uh, like $3,000 worth of damage on my car, my brand new car that I'd paid cash for first time in my life. But, <laughs> but it was only like $3,000 and I really didn't care. If it would have been totaled, I wouldn't have cared because it was okay. Yeah, like you and your lad, like safe. Mm -hmm. Like uh, three, like three grams of damage. Yeah, like if you had your old car, you never know. It could have been a lot yeah, worse. That's right probably again. why I bought the car that I did when I did. Wow. That's a crazy little, like, that's a crazy little miracle right there. My yes, God. absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm getting chills just having told you about it. It was, it was very traumatic. But I, I think all that I've done with death and dying and helping people and stuff, maybe be able to keep it in perspective. Mm. And, and I think that that's why, why when I'm talking to people and helping them with writing through their grief or whatever they're doing, going through their grief, I've got such a positive perspective. And as strange as this may sound, I really am happier now than I've ever been in my whole life. Yeah. And like, does that happen to stem for just the experiences you've had over the last few years? I think it comes from, from recognizing that I, it, we were talking about love earlier. Yeah. I, I finally am fully recognizing in my life that all there is is love. Mm -hmm. And so I should be happy. Both Ron and, and Jacques had amazing lives, really amazing, beautiful lives and accomplished great things in their lives. And, and it was okay for them to go. Didn't make me miss them any less. Mm -hmm. But it, it was okay. And I understood how people do go. And I was grateful. I actually got to spend that quality time with both of them toward the end because both, both of them had the same two diseases. Both of them uh, I took care of for two years before they died. And I am, I'm grateful to have had those experiences. And I'm, I'm grateful to be able to use what I've learned from all this to help other people. No, no, that is good. No, that is good. Like this is the thing. Um, I, and people who have been close to death, like this is like sometimes, well, if they don't fall into the little trap, which I think it helps people just get on with life where, ah, oh, yeah, I've got to do this. This person's past. I've got to live life to the full. I've got to make sure I go and travel. I've got to make sure I go kiss a girl, kiss a guy, do whatever. And like, yeah, live life to the fullest. And cue something like three months later and yeah that's kind of faded yeah. away uh disappeared um like would you say it's now sort of giving you sort of a spark more of an emphasis to sort of like yeah maybe construct a little bucket list of your own to like go on and do other things that's an interesting question because uh, i i had thought about that mm. and I realized as I was thinking, what would I put on my bucket list? What would I want to do? And I realized that anything that I really had a desire to do, I've done. I've had quite an amazing life with all the things that I've done. And after Ron died, I thought, well, you know, I never did. Get, we traveled a lot around the world, but I never yeah. did get to Tuscany and I never did get to Bali. And so I went both of those places by myself. Um, I do ceramic sculpture and there's an organization uh, it, that's a nationwide organization of ceramists that part of what they do is travel to different countries and learn about ceramics and create 
things that they're they're doing there. And both of the places I, I got to go participate in ceramics at those two places and see all the beautiful art and they were it was amazing and I was traveling with people in that organization who were kind of like-minded we, we loved art we loved to create things and we had a, a good time together I didn't know them before I went there but it wasn't like one of those tours like oh if it's Tuesday it must be Belgium sort of tour yeah you know it was it was something constructive where we were learning something we were doing something I brought home things pieces that I made it in both trips and then after that, I thought, well, where else do I want to go? And I said, well, I don't really want to go anyplace else. I would welcome an opportunity to go someplace else. I, I wouldn't turn it down. Um, but I don't really feel, you know, I'm, I'm living in probably what I consider the most beautiful place in the world. I'm living in a place where everything's based on love by law. <laughs> you know? It's like, Alan, it's the law. What, yeah, <laughs> to live your life with love. It's the law. What, yeah. What if you don't? And I've, I've had two fabulous husbands. I've, um, you know, I've, I've had such a good life that I feel like right now I can do anything I want to do, and I don't have to do anything that I'm not interested in. Yeah. You know what? You are a rare breed of person. You know, like the reason why I say this is because you've got people out there who, like, yeah, they've, like, they've acquired a num number of resources so they can pretty much do a number of things but it's very rare that you can simply say they basically they've got everything but whole thing is there's a it's a very rare quality indeed in people when they can say I've practically lived everything I wanted to live you never really get that very very unique you are that unique snowflake. You are that unique unicorn, as they say. Yeah. What, like, <laughs> what do you have to say to that, my lady? Well, you know, I, I am. I, I agree with you. And I've, I've done so many things in my life. We've just, you know, got the tip of the iceberg here of all mm. the, the different things I like. And as I re reflect on my life, I can remember points in my life where I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could get to do that? Mm. And then later in my life, that happened. An example was when I took my first writing class in college. I, had, I didn't think I could write. I couldn't spell. Um, I can now because I use a computer. But <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was really enjoying the writing class, and I was really surprised. And one day the teacher came in, and he says, I've just got to tell you, last night, my publisher was in town and they took me to this restaurant and it was in San Diego. It was the most fantastic restaurant, expensive, top of the building, glorious restaurant. Uh, and he said that my publisher took me out to dinner and we celebrated my signing of my contract for my was like third book or something. And I said, I'm going to do that someday. Not having any idea that I was going to be writing books. Mm. Well, after I was, uh, reading or writing my um, textbooks. My, I was also working as a, a, a reader, they called it, for the educational testing service for the GMAT exam, which is an exam that you take to get to, into uh, graduate programs. Yeah. And they had an essay component and they had to have people read them. And it was before there were computers readily available. So they would fly us all to Princeton, New Jersey, and we would read essays all day long. And as soon as we were through, we'd run downstairs and get on the express bus that took you into New York City uh, to the Port Authority. And from there, we would run to the half price ticket booth and see what Broadway shows we could get into that night. <laughs> and I, I did this like three times a year for several years, and it, it was really cool. And one of the times that I was back there, my publisher said, I'd really like to meet you because we've always just talked on the phone. Can we go to the Plaza Hotel for lunch? Nice. So here I am sitting at the Plaza Hotel looking out over uh, Central Park. And I said, that intention I set back in that writing class came true. That's exactly what happened. Liking it. Not <laughs> <laughs> Like you know what, like there, like my lady, 
I, like she must really like I don't know if she, if she would hug you or like curse you because like yeah she had to do the GMAT uh, because like to get into business school so yes she's like I'm, you're the you're one of the architects of my pain for like a, a good like <laughs> six month period what she got in yeah got 720 I believe wow uh, she might like it might be more but yeah I'm gonna say 720 if it is more yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, to like simply go, yeah, I'm going to do that one day and it to come true. Like, is there, has there been any other moments recently where you've like going to go, you know what? There is so many of them. I'm going to do that. Like, what would you say is one of the ones which you went, oh, I'm going to do that. And it's taking you by surprise, would you say? Well, one of them was, uh, I told you that I, I love theater. Yeah. And I had been teaching at the university for a while and I was I was frustrated with something that was going on there. And I thought, you know what, this isn't making me happy right now. And mm. I want to do something that will make me happy. And I had been involved in community theater in the, the community for a long time and did lots. And I thought, I'm just going to create my own theater. <laughs> So, and it was, I always wanted to do things, you know, seriously in theater. So I didn't know what I would do to do this. I, I went to several banks to talk to them about getting a, a loan to get a place to do it. And they said, theater, no, you're not a good risk. I said, but I've got this ambulance company. I've got all this stuff. To and they said, no, theater, you're not a good risk. Yeah. So I thought, well, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do. And then an artist friend of mine um, told me that the building that she was in, that was in downtown in the community where I was, and it was a beautiful hundred year old building, which was a rarity there because there'd been a big earthquake in 1953 where most of downtown had been leveled. And so there were very few of these beautiful old buildings there. And her office was high upstairs in this, this building. And she said, I, I need you to talk to the guy who owns the building. And the basement and bottom two, there, there was a basement, uh, ground level floor, and then a, a big mezzanine above. And they'd been empty for a long time. And she said, I think you might be able to put the theater there. And I said, well, it's, it's a wonderful size. It's a wonderful location, but nobody's going to give me the money to do it. And she said, you could just go talk to the owner. Mm. Well, I knew the owner. I was on, on the board for the arts society at the university and he was too. And he didn't even know my name. We'd been on the board for, together for years. And I always thought of him as very aloof, you know, <laughs> he owned half of downtown and I, I, for my friend, I made an appointment with him and I went down and he listened to me and he said, I'm very interested in what you have to say. But I know everybody thinks I'm rich, but I don't have nearly as much money as my wife does. So I'm going to talk to my wife and then I want you to come back and see me. They bankrolled the theater. My God. <laughs> And it had uh, the, the basement we were able to make into classrooms uh, for arts classes, the, the kids. We had a big uh, dance floor put in. We had a piano room where we had several electric pianos so they could have a piano class. Then lots of acting spaces where they could take classes for that downstairs. Then on the main floor, we, we built a 99 seat theater and had a, a big sweeping staircase that went from the lobby up to the level of the mezzanine and then had stadium seating from the mezzanine level down to the stage. So it was, it was and quite beautiful because the, the it had those pressed tin ceilings and it was a beautiful building. And I built into the front of it a, a coffee bar. It's a, like a place where people could get refreshments when they came. And that evolved when a friend of mine came over and she said, I think that we need to make it into a cafe. And I said, I don't have time to sleep right now. I don't know what I would do. She said, I'll do it. She says, oh, can we just do it here? So we ended up with a cafe catering company, espresso bar and ice cream bar all in the lobby of the theater. And there were great big, beautiful walls in that lobby. So that became an art gallery. 
and I was able to, to support local artists and, and give them with, when every new show would open a different art show would open at the same time so they could have a, a big reception honoring their, their shows that they had up. No, it's, so. it's, it's there more. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have to ask. Uh, well, actually with that, when, when I started it, I, I, was, I really wanted to be sure that any kids that wanted to take an arts class could. Yeah. And so I, I thought we need a nonprofit foundation and I'm not going to do the theater as a nonprofit because I'd been on boards for nonprofits before and getting along with everybody and having people agree on anything was such a challenge. And I wanted to ensure since my money was going into it, mm. that it was being spent wisely. And so I, I invited all my friends to a meeting and said, what do you think about starting a nonprofit foundation that would provide scholarships for kids to take classes at the school here? And they got on board and they loved it. And they can, they write about when the theater opened, the nonprofit foundation also opened. And then when Jacques got to the point where he was really sick seven years later, um, I went to that board for the foundation and I said, I really want to be with my husband while he's this. And right now I'm doing payroll, sitting at my computer, sitting next to his hospital bedside. I'm not getting any sleep. I'm not being able to be at the theater when I need to. I said, if I donate this theater to you, would you accept it? And they said, yes. And so that was another miracle that the theater was able to keep going. I didn't have to be involved. It didn't go away because I wanted to spend time with my husband. And I got to spend those last two years with my husband. Mm. You see, like, like, see, like, this is the thing, like, <laughs> those are some crazy opportunities, like, you know, seren like, quite a lot of serendipitous moments coming together time and time and time and time again to make all of that happen. And, like, look, all I've got to simply say is, look, like, to do what you've done in, like, in one lifetime would be like, hey, you know, that would be great. That's a life well lived. But to like go from, yes, let me like, let me start a theater company. Let me now start a cafe, like, well, a little cafe at the side then turn it into a full size cafe with an art gallery, then basically ha giving out scholarships for kids who want to pursue art to then go on to go. That is a lot for like, you know what, extremely a lot, very talented uh, to say the least. Like through that period of time, how did you muster the energy to keep so many things going all at once? Passion, mm. I loved what I was doing. And Jacques, in addition to being a philosophy professor was an incredible singer and actor. Mm. And I mentioned he was a lot older than I was. Uh, if we, when he was in college, he had done a lot of acting and he had a live radio show in Los Angeles when they, they used to do live shows where he had a pianist and he sang uh -huh. and they had this show that they, they would do every week because his voice was just gorgeous. And he hadn't done any theater because right when he got out of college, he, he went into the Air Force. And so he just stopped doing anything together with theater at all until we got together. And he goes, you know, I wonder if I could do that. And I said, I'm sure you could. And so he, he found a place with, he, he did before we started the theater, he'd been doing a lot of acting and singing in town. And he was just thrilled when we started the theater because he could perform, he could sing. Uh, it was a really wonderful opportunity for him. So he spent a lot of time down there too. And so we were, it wasn't like I was leaving him home alone. He was right there uh, doing stuff with it. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, now I have to ask. Mm. Now, if you could have a dinner party and you could invite four guests from past, present, future, fiction, or reality. Who would be the three guests you have at your dinner party and why? Wow. Wow. Um, 
I think Shakespeare, because I'd want to know the truth about <laughs> Shakespeare and did he really write all those plays? Because there's so many rumors about it. And I've, I've done so much work in theater with Shakespeare and, and love Shakespeare. So Shakespeare. Uh, Mother Teresa, Teresa, because I, I love her humility, her compassion, her service. She's such an inspiration. And um, maybe Nelson Mandela, because I just am so amazed that he accomplished so much while he went through so much that he, he's just such an example of strength and also compassion. Mm. Right, I see. And what would you have as the main course at the this? The main point? course. I would um, have it be a lovely vegetarian or vegan meal. Mm. And it would be it would be luscious. A lot of people think vegetarian and vegan food can't be that good, but it can. And uh, it, we would have just, just really wonderful, tasty things. I see, I see. So, interesting. But Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, and Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare, just because of your curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> like Mother yeah because I, I love all the Shakespeare plays, you know. <laughs> He's such an influence in the world of theater. Yeah, I must really ask him what he was drinking when he came up with that amid the summer. Yeah. Now, I was like, oh, he was like, oh. <laughs> you know, it is. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or was he cream like, like Queen Elizabeth in disguise? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh, that's a very interesting dinner party. Uh, very nice, like, yeah, very interesting. Like, not too sure, like if Mother Teresa would like have much to say, or she'll be like, "Yeah, <laughs> thank you." She might be. I don't think <laughs> she she talked a whole lot, but boy, when she said anything, it was profound. Mm. The world did listen. It did listen hard. Yes. So, yeah. So, are you doing anything else apart from the book? And like the reason why I say this, I, I have this vibe that just doing the book. And like basically the the group you get together, hopefully they should be coming together a lot more now because mm -hmm. like restrictions are coming off left, right, and center. Is there anything else you've got on your on your ticket keeping you busy, keeping you out of mischief? I think <laughs> I think you need this, you know, to keep you out of mischief. Mm. Well, there's there's a few things. One of them is um, I have a really big yard here and especially when the shutdown started with the pandemic and it happened before when we had hurricane warnings, but it was magnified tremendously that we are probably the most isolated place in the world. And we're highly dependent on um, cargo ships coming in to bring food and supplies. Mm -hmm. And when they didn't come for a while, the shelves were bare. And so I had, I'd always had some food growing here, mostly uh, tropical fruits because they were here when we moved here. And I thought I'm, I'm gonna make a um, permaculture garden in my yard and share it with my neighbors and anybody who needs food. So I have a, a large permaculture garden now. And I, I love doing that. We get together, I get together with part of my Ohana every Friday from uh, five to six and we bring whatever we've got out of our yards and share it with each other. No, no money's exchanged or anything. We just share things. And that's, and that's going to be growing again because it was growing until the pandemic. And when, when there was a shutdown, we stopped doing it at all for a while, but then we were realizing we needed food. Yeah. And <laughs> if we <laughs> wore our masks and we always did it outside and we were always very much socially distanced, we were able to uh, still provide food for each other. So I'm doing that. Um, I, as I mentioned, I like to do ceramic sculpture. And I've, I've also learned to draw since uh, Ron died. I started taking drawing classes and I love to draw. It's, it's just a lot of fun. And Jacques' granddaughter, my step-granddaughter, is a professional jazz musician. Mm -hmm. uh, she went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. I don't know if you know of that place, but it's, it's quite amazing. Okay. 
and she she plays upright bass and sings at the same time and she's married to a drummer who also went to berkeley and they until the pandemic had been touring the world doing jazz concerts all over the world and then they haven't been out for a while <laughs> they they came to see us one time on in maui when ron was here and they said we want to just come someplace where we're not going to play we're at kind of a break between gigs and we just want to relax and like go to the beach and i said sure fine no problem i've got a guest room just come over and hang out well because ron was um not having a lot of energy at that time he was mentally he was perfect till the end but mm. he just uh wasn't able to do as much as he would like to do yeah so we sat outside a lot on our lanai we call it here it's like a deck outside and they would sit out there with us every day and we'd have these long conversations and ron was incredibly inspirational and they got to talking about it and he said you need to come here and do a concert and they said well that'd be okay and so we managed to get that arranged we've got a big um uh, it's called the maui arts and cultural center here and we were able to get sponsors and get that arranged. Then it took about a year before they came over and they came back and did that. And we introduced them to people. Uh, actually, unfortunately, it's after Ron died. So he, he didn't get to go to the concert. Mm. But they uh, we introduced them to somebody who has a, a nonprofit foundation here who works with kids and arts education on the island, which is close to my heart. And they got to talking and they said what they'd really like to do now both of these kids have been playing i've got i've got a picture of katie playing her uh, a violin when she was in diapers and i i saw a picture of matt her husband who wasn't much older playing on his drum set yeah. <laughs> so they, they they have been playing music their whole lives so they've gone to a lot of jazz camps and different uh opportunities where they'd go and study someplace and Katie's been working with the Monterey Jazz Festival for several years now. She performs there, but she also uh, conducts a young women's, um, I think it's jazz group that are, they audition from all over and they, they get together several times before the festival. They perform at the festival and then they, they perform other places too. And she does that for the Monterey Jazz Festival. Nice. And she's made connections every place. So they all got to talking and said, you know, it would be really cool to do a jazz camp here on Maui. So uh, in 2019, they did their first jazz camp. It wasn't as big as they planned on it being ultimately, but it was a nice size to, to get started with it. it. lasted a week and they brought a pianist with him who is phenomenal. Uh, actually, he's made a movie you should check out. It's on Netflix called Keep On, Keeping On. And it, it is an amazing, amazing movie. I, I just can't recommend it highly enough. But it, it talks about how he's, uh, even though he's blind, he's a phenomenal pianist. And he had, and I don't know if you know who Clark Terry is. He was a, a jazz great, one of the very first jazz greats that people knew what his name was. Mm -hmm. and he met Justin while he was in college and became his mentor okay. and he ended up being the last person that he mentored his name is Clark Terry and Clark mentored Justin and the first person that Clark mentored was uh, Quincy Jones no way <laughs> no way and so uh justin met quincy through clark terry and the movie's about this whole thing yeah. and so because of his relationship with quincy jones he's had these wonderful opportunities like at montreux jazz festival and quincy has a jazz club in the versace hotel in dubai now and so justin did a residence there and um justin told clark you know you need to have katie and matt come over and do a residence too so they came over they, they spent a month in, in dubai performing every night at his jazz club and quincy loves them he calls katie he says this girl is it that's his quote about katie <laughs> and so um you yeah, know they they know the big people they they have have the chops and have the connections and so they weren't able to do the jazz camp 
last year. They did some stuff virtually because yeah. of the, the lockdown and they, they still were in contact with, with students and were able to do things virtually. And this year they were hoping to do it again, but we didn't know far enough in advance that there was any possibility. So uh, it had opened up enough so that two weekends ago they came here to Maui and did a concert as a fundraiser for next year's jazz camp. Uh -huh. And at that jazz camp, they're going to have a group for students, music students, that, like high school, college age students, and a group for adults who play jazz who want to play with other people and learn more about jazz and a group of jazz educators who can come and learn more about teaching jazz and talk to people about how they, the different things they do to teach jazz. So I've been involved in helping them with fundraising for making this happen because I'm, I'm just thrilled about it. I think it's, it's an amazing story. They're amazing people. This concert that they did this week was the first time they had been on stage since the shutdown. And so they were, they were hot. <laughs> I never saw happier performers in my life. And they put so much into that performance. It just took your breath away. They're amazing, amazing musicians. No, no, that's brilliant. No, because I uh, put it this way. Um, yesterday was the first day I've actually been in the office for like 15 months. So I was wow. like, yeah, it's like going... Yeah, this is a little bit strange. A friend of mine was taking the mic. Was like, oh, yeah, you see that thing with four legs uh, in front of you? Uh, yeah, it's called the desk. You might need to be associated <laughs> with it. But like, yeah, but to like to have your like to have yourself involved in that, like, like yeah, you are quite non-stop as well. Yeah. I, I go, Gotta oh. have something to do, you know. <laughs> well, yes, yes, you know what. A nice relaxing time, like on oh, yeah Maui, just like yeah, that would be like quite nice. Being able to look out and see yeah both sides of the island and go yeah, ah this is a magical place. But to like oh yeah you know what uh, <laughs> yeah, come on like I look I th I do believe you sucker punched uh, those two into it. It was like oh, yeah we're gonna get a theater to go in yeah yeah we're gonna get them back concert yeah before they know it a camp. Yeah, gonna make it happen gonna make it happen <laughs> oh, look, there's, there's only so much serendipity that you can have in one life like yeah uh, you can keep giving it you no, can no, keep no, getting no. it all the time yeah yeah, yeah. I, like i'm just now like i'm now sort of like going, yeah you planned this all out <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> we go. be careful what you wish for <laughs> uh, like this is thing like yeah i've got to say with your efforts and like yeah your positivity you've got you've you've achieved a lot and i think you've got a lot more left in the gas tank um yeah so with that what would you say you would like to do in the next say tw let's go with 12 to 18 months what would you like to do with that next 12 to 18 months just coming out of lockdown properly here we go well um there's a few things one of them is i want my second book to come out because this book uh initially had 52 chapters and when my publisher signed a contract for it, they, they signed it for the number of words that are in 52 chapters. And they, they wanted the, the book to be that long. Okay. Or they said, and then they handed it over to an editor for their company. And the editor called me and she goes, this book is way too long. We have to cut it drastically. Do you want to cut it or do you want my staff to cut it? I said, let me think about it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, cause I wanted everything in it, you know, obviously. So, I realized if it was twice as long as it needed to be, that it could be two books of 26 chapters because it was already written. So I talked to them and they said, yeah, we, we could go with that. If you can make the first one 26 chapters the way you want it to be. And then mm. after that one gets up and going, we'll publish the second one. So that's one of the reasons that I'm doing so much right now to get the word out all over the world uh, for people to buy the books. So the second one, the other half, can come out so that's that's a really exciting thing that i want to do the other thing i really want to do is is uh see more live music get to dance get get to go out to to enjoy a dinner that i didn't cook <laughs> i love to cook but <laughs> ah. just get to to uh spend more time walking on the beach 
and just en enjoy enjoy my life. That's what I want to do. Ah, oh, superb, superb. Like I say, here's to here's to dancing, here's to drinking, and a bit of like a bit of nice food. I know you didn't say drinking, but that that's why I threw in them to the mix. That's not bad. I like that too. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, mm, yeah, so yeah. I, I won't I won't lie. I, I'm partial to a little drink here and there. Like mm -hmm. you, you can have your vegan fare. I'll have the ribs and like yes, celebrations all around. Yeah, that's yes. What I'm <laughs> can you tell the lovely people out there how they can find you on the big wide webs? Well, my website is the same as the name of my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief dot com. Mm -hmm. Um, my book is available any place books are sold because it's uh, traditionally published. Uh, it's easy to get it on something like Barnes and Noble or uh, Amazon. And the bet it's it is anybody any booksellers can sell the book, so you can get it wherever you'd like to. Um, I have some things available online now. I'm creating. That's another thing I'm going to do in the next 12 to 18 months. I'm creating what I call a Grief and Happiness Alliance. It's kind of like a kind of like an organization, a group that'll come together. Uh, my plan right now is once a week, mm -hmm. and we'll do different writing exercises that, that help with grieving, and then we'll do different happiness techniques that can help you develop ways to to be happy and stay happy. And um, then we will also I plan on doing it on Zoom. So we can reach the, the most people and we'll have breakout sessions. So you get to know other people in the group who are experiencing the same kinds of things that you're experiencing that you can connect with to have that personal connection. Oh, superb, superb. So if, if you're interested in that on, on my website, you can sign up for my newsletter and everything will be coming out through that. And if you sign up for that, you'll get my weekly blog too, that uh, if you'd like to read that. Oh, perfect, perfect. While we also do, I'll put uh, I'll put all the links down in the description in the show notes. Uh, so yes, please go like follow Emily. Like yeah, where she might go. Uh, yes, uh, and I don't mean follow in a creepy way. I mean that yeah, uh, as a, <laughs> or online by so like sign up to things there and their blog. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's the way. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> but let me say this to you, Emily. You have been a joy, a pleasure to have uh, on the show today. Uh, yeah. Thank you uh, very much. I look forward to your return sometime in the future. Oh, I would be happy to come back. It's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Ah, the pleasure's all mine. The pleasure's all mine. Yes. And I'd like to say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors, who are still with us right now listening to the show. Please stay safe, stay well, be awesome, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Have a great day, guys. Ah, peace. And oh, we are.